Millions of people, including children, are currently taking part in the world's biggest medical experiment without even realizing it. Trials for new drugs take years, and the scientists running them are constrained by masses of red tape and regulation. But this experiment isn't being regulated by anyone, and the number of people involved is rising all the time. This is not the backdrop of some dystopian movie, it's the reality in many countries in 2024. I'm talking about the epidemic of vaping. A new research is shedding light on the health risks of e-cigarettes. The people who vape are exposed to more than 200 chemicals. Officials say a student was suddenly sickened after vaping. They can also result in seizures, throat irritation and nausea, as well as damage to the lungs. Supporters of vaping say it's helping people stop smoking and is much less harmful than smoking cigarettes. But is it actually true or based on any real data? To find out the truth about vaping, we actually need to go back in time to when everything was in black and white, food was just a little bit more boring, and cigarettes were healthy. Manipulation of the media, hell, that's what I pay you for. Our product is fine, I smoke them myself. As unbelievable as it might seem, between the 1920s and 1950s, tobacco companies in the US actively marketed cigarettes as being good for health. This resulted in the frankly ridiculous claim in a Philip Morris advertisement in 1937 that it had been proved conclusively that smoking their cigarettes would relieve the irritation caused by supposedly inferior cigarettes. As health concerns began to arise in the 1940s, tobacco companies companies started using doctors themselves as models in their advertising campaigns. What cigarette do you smoke, doctor? Once again, the brand named most was Camel. The appeal to authority is a well-known logical fallacy in which the opinion of a respected individual is cited as evidence for an argument instead of facts or reason. This is precisely what the tobacco companies did in their doctor ads. Around the same time, Rye Reynolds, another cigarette company, emphasized the slow absorption rate of nicotine as evidence that its cigarettes were less harmful than their competitors. Notice that there was no claim that their cigarettes were safe, simply that they were less harmful than others. Sound familiar? By the 1960s, the evidence linking tobacco smoking and lung cancer was undeniable. So the cigarette manufacturers changed their position. Instead of trying to argue that one brand of cigarette was any more or less harmful than another, they started promoting filter cigarettes. The idea was that cigarette filters would prevent the most harmful elements of burning cigarettes from being inhaled by the smoker. This had no scientific backing whatsoever, but was very useful marketing for tobacco companies, even though they had known since the 1930s that filters had basically no effect. What we see here is a pattern in which tobacco companies have consistently used misinformation, misdirection, and diversion tactics in order to keep people smoking. Literal smoke and mirrors. If you need any more evidence of that, here's a bunch of tobacco executives from the US testifying under oath that I don't believe that nicotine or our products are addictive. I believe nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. I believe that nicotine is not addictive. And I too believe that nicotine is not addictive. And in April 2024, as the UK government put forward a bill to ban the sale of tobacco products outright for anyone born after 2009, tobacco companies were lobbying MPs in an attempt to water down the legislation and buy themselves more time. They must be thanking their lucky stars that parliament was dissolved before that legislation could be passed due to the general election taking place on the 4th of July. But what does all this morally questionable mental gymnastics have to do with vaping? Well, I'm going to lift the lid on the link between vape companies and cigarette companies. And as you'll see, it's far from clear and incredibly murky. What links, if any, exist between the tobacco industry and the vape industry? In June 2023, the Observer newspaper published a story detailing how certain pro-vaping posts on social media were actually being organized by lobby groups that have received funding from tobacco companies. These posts seem like they've been created by simple grassroots campaigners, when in reality, they were the product of certain right-wing think tanks, some of whom we know have received funding from tobacco companies others of which we don't, because they don't reveal who funds them. Here's an example of one of their posts. 35% of respondents to this survey, and by the way, they don't tell us how many people that is, would be less likely to quit smoking if vape flavors were banned. 
so presumably 65% wouldn't. It's not surprising that tobacco giants don't want to be seen to be openly supporting vape companies when the general public, particularly young consumers, don't trust tobacco companies. Research from the US shows that when young people didn't know that vapes were produced by tobacco companies, they were more likely to use vapes compared to their peers who knew they were. This is a big problem for tobacco companies as according to the Truth Initiative, a non-profit public health organization, in the US, 96% of e-cigarette sales in 2018 were for brands owned by big tobacco firms. If e-cigarettes are less harmful than their tobacco containing alternatives, they will be a golden goose for tobacco companies, a product they can openly promote as reducing the harm to public health posed by the very same product they've made billions from for the last 100 years. After all, there is evidence that vapes are much safer than cigarettes, isn't there? You must have heard the claim that vapes are 95% less harmful than cigarettes. Well, let's take a closer look at that claim and you'll see things are not quite as they seem. In July 2013, a group of experts in the public health sphere met in London for a two-day workshop. So far, so ordinary. Little could they have known that what would come out of that meeting would fuel angry Reddit arguments and dodgy claims on social media posts for the next 10 years. Their objective was to quantify the risk to human health from a number of tobacco containing and non tobacco containing products. Sounds good, right? How do you suppose they decide how dangerous these products were? Test the individual ingredients in a lab for cancer causing potential, see what effect they had on living cells? Not quite. The panel identified 12 different products and defined 14 different harms those products could pose, such as a direct threat to human life, dependence, and various others. They then calculated an overall score out of 100 for each product, where 100 was the most dangerous and zero represented no harm. Cigarettes scored 99.6, no surprise there. E-cigarettes, in contrast, scored a mere four. This is clearly where the 95% less harmful figure comes from. After this study was published in 2014, it got picked up by Public Health England in a report they published in 2015, which has been quoted by pro-vaping activists ever since. Interestingly, the 2014 study identified nicotine replacement therapies as being the least dangerous product considered, less dangerous than e-cigarettes, although the Public Health England report didn't emphasize this finding as much as they did the one about vapes. However, the paper reported a number of limitations of its own research that didn't quite make it to the Public Health England report or the mainstream media at the time. For example, number one, the paper acknowledges that there was no hard evidence for the harm posed by these different products. In other words, the expert panel was simply making their best guesses about how dangerous they were, not ideal for a major public health policy. Well, they were experts, weren't they? I mean, we can trust what they said, can't we? Actually, no. As the report itself acknowledges, there was no formal criterion for the recruitment of those experts. In other words, as the Lancet reported at the time, the findings in this paper were based on extremely flimsy foundations, namely the opinions of a small group of people with no declared expertise in tobacco control in an absence of solid evidence. What's more, at least two of the authors of this paper had connections to smoking cessation products, including e-cigarettes, a huge conflict of interest and bias. In other words, we shouldn't be surprised that they found e-cigarettes to be so harmless. Yet none of this nuance was reported in the mainstream media at the time. And now nearly 10 years after that Public Health England press release, we see this weak as decaf argument that vaping is 95% safer than smoking, being repeated over and over on social media and by the vape industry itself ad nauseum. So why does this bad idea refuse to die? One answer to that might be a psychological phenomenon known as the mere exposure effect. This means the more we're exposed to an idea, regardless of how scientifically accurate it is, the more familiar it becomes and the more positive we feel towards it. Therefore, if you want to spread a dodgy idea, all that might be needed is to simply repeat it as much as possible in order for people to vote for it. But maybe I'm getting carried away with myself now. So if that Public Health England report was based on research that left rather a lot to be desired, what about some more methodologically sound research? So what does the most recent research say? A group of Australian researchers got together recently to try to answer that question. They looked at 400 peer-reviewed studies on the effects of e-cigarettes 
cigarette use on public health. Crucially, the researchers focused on randomized control studies, generally regarded as the best way of establishing whether a product like vapes causes harm or not. The report found that using nicotine e-cigarettes increases the risk of addiction, poisoning, toxicity from inhalation, and lung injury. They also found that young people who don't smoke but do vape were three times more likely than non-vapers to start smoking cigarettes regularly. Other studies have focused on the flavor compounds that are added to vapes. In one study, researchers found that rats exposed to nicotine-free flavored e-cigarette vapor had lower testes weight and increased cell death in the testes, while in a study performed with human cells, exposing sperm cells to nicotine-free flavored e-cigarettes was found to result in reduced sperm motility. There's a joke in there somewhere, but I haven't got the balls to say it. Other research done in mice showed that just four weeks of regular exposure to vapor resulted in an observable loss of spatial memory and reduction in brain-derived neurotropic factor, a protein that supports nerve cell growth and survival in the hippocampus, and it's a telltale early sign of Alzheimer's disease. The thing that all these studies have in common is their acknowledgement that we simply don't have enough data to make strong claims about the long-term consequences of e-cigarettes. In many ways, we're in the same position with vapes now that we were back in the 1940s with cigarettes. The evidence we have at the minute is incomplete at best, but suggests that e-cigarettes are harmful in the short term. Definitive evidence of the long-term consequences of vaping might take decades to come as we wait to see the outcomes in people who've been vaping for that long. If you, your child, or someone you know vapes, perhaps the question you need to ask yourself is if you, or they would want to volunteer or be the guinea pig in this big trial. But before we talk about the future of vaping, let's address one other fact about vapes that's essential to their marketing now. Why is this consumer product that is clearly targeted at young people deliberately being made addictive? Why do vapes contain nicotine? Nicotine is the addictive compound in tobacco. This means that e-cigarette manufacturers can produce vapes containing nicotine and still claim to be tobacco free. Not all e-cigarettes contain nicotine, but many do. Think about that for a minute. What possible reason can there be for including nicotine in vapes other than to make them addictive? Can you imagine nicotine being added to any other consumer product? There would be a public scandal. So why do we turn a blind eye to products that are clearly marketed towards young people containing an addictive compound? And by the way, let's not pretend that vape companies aren't deliberately targeting young people with their marketing. From the free samples, to the potential AI-generated influencers, to the whole vape aesthetic that's so often promoted. It's disingenuous to suggest anything else. Well, there might be a lesson to learn from another widely available addictive drug alcohol. What could be more 1990s than oversized mobile phones, floppy-haired boy bands battling moody Brit poppers for chart supremacy, and tabloid newspapers throwing their hands up about alcopops? Remember them? Those fruit, juice, and spirit combinations with the exotic names, they were everywhere back in the 90s and no student disco was complete without them. Well, it didn't take long for the industry watchdogs to clamp down on the cartoonish packaging that drinks manufacturers were using even in the 1990s. In more recent times, it's become debatable whether we are seeing the effects of those drinks in patients with liver disease now in their 40s. Will we see something similar with vapes? What can we expect the future of these addictive products to be? What will the future of vaping be? The only thing we can be sure about is that we don't know for sure. More evidence will come forward, vape manufacturers will continue to innovate, and individuals and corporations will continue to manipulate evidence to suit their own agendas. Whether or not we learn from history is up to us, but there's enough evidence to be very, very cautious about the use of e-cigarettes for anyone other than smokers who are trying to give up. If you want to learn more about your health and go beyond the surface of health trends or wellness industry scams, why not check out these videos on probiotics, Ozempic, supplements, or continuous glucose monitors. If you enjoy good science and bad jokes on occasion, you're only a subscribe button click away from more of that. See you naughty nuggets next time.